everyone, and welcome um, to our webinar today. I hope uh, everyone had no trouble logging on to the, to the webinar today. I'd like to thank you all for joining us and uh, to hear about us talk about opportunities about being involved with the CADIS Symposium to be held next spring in 2019. Uh, my name is Tamara Rader. I'm one of the patient engagement officers at CADIS, which stands for Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology in Health here in Ottawa. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. So one of our goals this year was to encourage and support more people from the patient community to become involved with their, our annual symposium. In particular, we'd really like to have more patient representatives on the abstract review committee, and we would also like to encourage more people to submit abstracts in the hopes that the 2019 program will reflect more topics of interest to the patient community. Today's webinar will begin with a quick reminder of what CADIS is. Um, uh, Peter Chinnick will give a talk about the CADIS Symposium in general. Linda Wilhelm is with us today and she'll share her experience of submitting an abstract and presenting at the symposium. Finally, Maureen Smith will describe what it's like to serve on the abstract review committee. We've left time at the end for a question and answer period. And if we don't get to your question, please do send it anyway and we'll reply. You can type your question into the chat box in, on your screen or you can send it by email. And then finally, I'll close the webinar by sharing some key dates this fall to help you in your planning. Um, this is the order of today's speakers, as I mentioned. As most of you on the line already know, CADIS is a health technology assessment agency that aims to deliver credible scientific evidence and management strategies for appropriate use of drugs and health technology. More information about our work is available on the CADIS website. So I won't go into too much more detail, but you can feel free to, to browse our website. CADIS is funded by the federal, provincial, and territorial ministries of health. It receives application fees for three programs. Common Drug Review, the Pan-Canadian Oncology Drug Review, and our Scientific Advice Program. Our first speaker is Peter Chinnick. Peter is the moderator of the CADIS Symposium and leads the team here at CADIS in organizing the program and the overall event. Peter will give some history and background about the symposium and some activities that we've got planned to enhance the patient experience. And the specific information um, about the 2019 symposium will be shared also. Peter? Thanks very much, Tamara. Uh, my disclosure builds on the general CADIS disclosure that uh, on a previous slide. Uh, I'm a full-time employee at CADIS and I have been since 2002. What I'd like to add to the general disclosure is that the CADIS Symposium is funded through registration fees and sponsorships. Sponsorship opportunities are not available to entities that stand to benefit financially from the results of CADIS reviews. Next slide. The CADA Symposium was launched in 2005 to provide a forum for productive discussion between parties committed to the use of evidence-based information and advice to inform policy, influence practice, and improve health. We also saw the symposium as a way to build capacity to produce and use evidence and evidence-informed uh, advice and recommendations. And finally, we wanted a way to share information, foster a better understanding of different perspectives in the healthcare space, and jointly look for solutions and new approaches to enhance the quality and sustainability of healthcare in Canada. Next slide. We've been reasonably successful in those goals. From modest attendance of 150 in that first year, we now routinely attract 750 to 850 registrants every year, with our highest attendance to date being 915 in 2017. Next slide. You might be surprised to learn that for the first few years, the symposium was an invitational event open only to HTA researchers, academics, and policymakers. Over time, we gradually opened the symposium to a broader range of stakeholders. Today, I routinely hear from attendees that the diversity of opinion and perspectives is an integral part of what makes the CADA Symposium such an engaging and useful event. Next slide. Here's a breakdown of the different types of stakeholders who attend the symposium. 
This is based on self-identification over the last couple of years. HTA producers that's from agencies and universities account for about 25, sorry, 29 percent of participants. Uh, representatives from uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers, medical device companies, and consultants is also about 29%. Uh, from the public health system, ministries, hospitals, and health authorities, we can get another 18%. Uh, doctors and other healthcare professionals account for about 6% of attendees. Patients uh, account for about 9%, and students account for about 9% of the total audience. We have attendees from all across Canada, and in recent years, from 10 to 12 other countries every year. I would also note that the number of patients and student participants has grown in recent years. Three or four years ago, patients accounted for about 6% of overall attendee. So a jump to 9% is a significant increase. Next slide, please. Part of this can be attributed to the fact that we've been making a concerted effort to enhance the symposium experience for underrepresented groups, such as patients. For the past three years, for example, we have been accredited as a patients included event, meeting all five of the clauses in the patients included charter. For patients, we also provide useful background information in advance, uh, such as an info sheet on HCA terms and commonly used acronyms. We also hold an introductory workshop on HCA as part of the, the symposium program. Our travel awards, which cover up to $2,000 in travel accommodation and registration costs, support patient participation at the symposium. We have a separate uh, awards program for students as well. And we also hold a meet and greet for the patient community at the symposium on Sunday evening before things get underway in earnest. Next slide. Now let's turn our attention to the 2019 CATA Symposium, which is about seven months away. It will be held in Edmonton, Alberta on April 14 to 16, 2019. Not only is it the 15th annual symposium we've put on, it is also an opportunity to celebrate CATA's 30th anniversary. Next slide. The symposium theme for 2019 is supporting health system transformation. We know the health system is changing. There are lots of discussions about a possible national pharmacare initiative going on. Gene therapies hold the promise of curing various ailments, but often at a steep price. There are new and disruptive drugs and medical devices. Digital technologies are forcing us to look at how to utilize data from old and new sources to, su to support decision making. Not to mention patient-centered care, value-based procurement, and many other trends. So this year, the symposium will look at the role of health technology assessment, HTA, and health technology management, HTM, to support the transformation that is occurring in healthcare. Excellent. Now, before we go, go on and get into the specifics of, uh, of, of abstracts uh, and uh, the review process, I just wanted to mention some of the, uh, the various formats that people can, can, can present uh, abstracts in. So the first are poster presentations. Posters can be a really good way to present targeted research or significant work in progress. They're also a, a great way to, uh, to set up an opportunity to talk one-to-one -one with people who are interested in your work. So people don't come to see your poster unless they're interested in the topic, and that means you can have a really engaging conversation. Oral presentations or PowerPoint presentations, usually 15 to 20 minutes long, including time for questions. We group the, uh, the oral presentations thematically. So there's usually three or four talks on the same topic scheduled at the same time. A panel discussion, brings together up to four experts plus a moderator to focus on a particular topic. A panel is one hour and 15 minutes long. Breakfast sessions are usually held early on Tuesday morning. They tend to be fairly informal and they bring together groups of people with a shared interest in a particular topic. And finally, workshops. Workshops are highly interactive and are often but not always focused on technical or methodological issues. You can propose either a half day or a full day workshop. So that gives you a sense of what the options are, and I'll turn it back to Tamara. Thank you very much, Peter. Listening to the types of presentations and discussing them is an excellent segue to our topic of our next speaker. I'm very pleased to introduce Linda Wilhelm. Linda has been the president of the Canadian Arthritis Patient Alliance and someone who's been living with rheumatoid arthritis for 35 years. 
She and her colleagues at CAPA have been regular contributors to the CATA Symposium program, and Linda will discuss her experiences with the submission process and in presenting her work at the symposium. Linda? Thank you, Tamara, and hopefully everybody can hear me good. Uh, very happy to be here and thank Kadith for putting this on. Uh, really important, and uh, I'd like to just go to the next slide and uh, talk about our experience. Uh, so just to disclose your slide, this is, comes from directly from our Kappa patient input submissions that we submit, and uh, but also for the next slide. Uh, we are all volunteers, so the money we get from CAPA does we do not take salaries for. We are all volunteers on our board living with inflammatory arthritis. We are a virtual organization, so we have no bricks and mortar office. Uh, we only have a very small part-time admin support, and then we have a, an accountant who takes care of our books for us. So next slide. This is some of our activities that uh, we that we do, and we've been developing resources for patients, and uh, working with our researchers and collaborating with researchers. Uh, we also provide opportunities for other patients, and we uh, disseminate knowledge for other patients. Uh, quarter new newsletter, and our website and Facebook social media. Next slide. Uh, so we have submitted abstracts for both the 2017 symposium and 2018 symposium. 2017 was accepted for a poster, and 2018 we did a panel presentation. Uh, we all, we submit abstracts for many conferences because we think that they are a great opportunity, a fantastic opportunity to showcase what CAP is doing to everybody and it's a great knowledge translation and uh, just as uh, recently we were at the European League of Rheumatology meeting, uh, we uh, had a poster on our methotrexate resource and the Spanish uh, patient organization have actually adapted that and now they are translating that resource into Spanish for their own website. So internationally it's even given us opportunities. Uh, Generally, we list all our board members as co-authors and because we all help each other with developing the posters and or the presentations. So because we're all living with inflammatory arthritis and it's an unpredictable disease, uh, if the person who actually you know, was lead on a project can't submit or can't attend, uh, then somebody else can jump in. And that was the case with my poster uh, that I abstract that I submitted last year. Uh, I didn't make it to the opening poster session, but then Lori Pruel, who lives in Ottawa, uh, was able to just jump in at the last minute and fully uh, aware and informed of what we were working on and what was doing. So could, did a very great job in presenting the poster at that symposium. Next slide. So this is the abstract submission form on the website. I have found the CADETH abstract submission process to be very straightforward. What I usually have done is I kind of go through the, the submission process uh, and have a look at what's required and do my abstract in a Word document that I can cut and paste into the actual submission uh, so that everything's kind of already laid out and straightforward. Next slide. So it just kind of goes through what the information that they're going to require, which is why I like to go through it first to make sure I have all that information handy. Next slide. And then this is some of the information again that uh, identifies yourself for what you wanted, what your abstract is for, and what you what you'd hope to get it accepted as. Next one. And this is goes into the actual abstract and just kind of gives you a good idea of what. Uh, you know, what, what you want to present on and who your audience is and uh, what's your focus. Next slide. And this is where you kind of can cut and paste your abstract into here and make sure you have your word count and uh, know what you're going to say before you actually push the submit button for your abstract. Next slide. Next slide. This is just giving you an idea of what it looks like. So, as I said, I found the process very easy to navigate. And if I have ever had any questions, the CATA staff 
respond very quickly and are a fantastic resource. The only complaint that I would have would be the timing of the abstract being accepted and the announcement of who gets the travel awards. Uh, and that timeline could, could be a little closer together. Uh, first, our CAP is a very small organization and these travel awards really play a huge role on whether or not we're gonna be able to attend this symposium. Uh, so to know when you're, you know, to make your travel plans and to be able to plan things, it'd be nice to have that timeline a little closer. Uh, I find that it's supposedly been very, been very accepting of the patient perspective. Uh, and I think that this is the symposium itself, as Peter alluded to, uh, is, is such a diverse audience that it does create a good awareness of your organization and what you do when you are involved in a panel presentation or a poster session, because there's just so, di so much diversity in the audience there and provides so many more opportunities that can come from that, you know, being at the CADA Symposium. Next slide. So that's going to be it from me. I'm going to wrap up now and I guess we'll save questions and answers to the end. Uh, but there's my email address and if anybody has any other questions, they can certainly email me and I'm available to answer any questions you or any thoughts you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. That was great. Thanks for that practical advice and showing um, what the form looks like so people know what they're getting into when they're about to submit an abstract. Terrific. It's now my pleasure to introduce Maureen Smith as our next speaker. Maureen is a board member of the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders. She also serves as a patient member with Ontario's Committee to Evaluate Drugs and the Ontario Health Technology Advisory Committee. Among her other activities, Maureen has volunteered for the CADIS Symposium as part of the Abstract Review Committee, and she'll share her experiences and describe this role. Maureen? Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to see so, to uh, hear that so many people have signed up for, for this webinar. As a patient, I think it's very encouraging that there's so much interest. So um, hopefully this will be the beginning of your involvement or the continuation of your involvement with CADIS. Next slide. So I, I don't have any competing interests with regards to this presentation. I'm just here as a patient to speak to you about my experiences uh, in the past two years of serving on the abstract review committee. Next slide. All right, so what everyone wants to know, what is your commitment? How much of this time is this going to take? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to respond to a call for abstract reviewers. Um, it's issued in mid-September, so it should be coming up pretty soon, and closes in late October. So if you are, if you go to CADIS website and you subscribe uh, as a uh, subscriber to to CADIS, you will you will get the email announcement, which is the easiest way to get it. Or you, it's also all over social media, and it's on the CADIS website. But I highly recommend that if you're a busy volunteer, that you um, go ahead and sign up to get the automatic. Um, announcements from, from CADIS. Um, what, you, what you'll do is you'll review abstracts uh, that are being submitted for the 2019 symposium. Um, every abstract will have a minimum of three reviewers. Uh, the CADIS staff will look at who's applied to be on the committee and then will assign the abstracts um, to, to the to the right people, the people who will, who who are um, who, who have some interest in that area or who are able to comment on that area, you'll be asked to score each abstract and recommend whether it whether or not it should it should be accepted. You'll you'll receive somewhere between ten and twenty abstracts per reviewer. You'll have two weeks to complete the reviews. Um, the website saves your work. So you can complete it in installments. I think one year I did it all in one shot. I was very enthusiastic. And last year I took I took my time and I went back, I think, two, two, two or three times. So your total commitment is really one to two hours of work over two weeks. Um, and the key part of, of the job is really the comments that you're able to put supporting your decision. So of course the scoring is important, but the uh, the staff at, at CADIF looks very closely at the comments. 
Next slide. So I'm going to show you uh, an, an abstract example from the 2017 uh, symposium. If you were at the symposium, you might recognize that this, this was actually one of the abstracts that, that was accepted. So this is what you are going to get in your in your inbox. This is what you'll, 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 you'll be looking at. There'll be an ID. Of course, there's no names attached to the abstracts, so you're not uh, uh, in there voting for your friends. <laughs> And uh, there'll, there'll be the title and um, the primary audience um, and what, what the presentation preference is. So for this group, they wanted to have a panel discussion, but you'll see on the evaluation form, you could also say, well, you know, I don't think this is really suitable for a panel discussion. I think it would be better for a poster or, or, or some other form of presentation. So that's really, that's really something you, you can put in, 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 in in the comments and then you've got the objectives and of course the keywords next slide and this is what the abstract will look like now um, in this one uh, it doesn't specifically say which stakeholders will form the panel some of the abstracts do some don't i've been told um, by tamara that they are going to uh, fix that this year so that um, so that there will be um, the, 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 the the submitters will have to say which stakeholder groups um, are going to be are going to be part of the panel. But of course, in the in the years previous to this, when I was reviewing it, I wasn't shy to to suggest um, which groups. And uh, of course, you can probably know what I'm what I'm getting at because I'm coming from the patient community. I wasn't shy to say, well. You know, I hope that there'll be, you know, there should be a member of the patient community or a, a, a patient representative or a caregiver on this panel. So that's part of what you can absolutely do as a as a reviewer. Next slide. This is what the evaluation form looks like. So it's quite it's quite short. So the the theme of 2019 will be uh, will will be there, and they'll be asked if it's relevant to the symposium theme, and abstract and content will be useful to the symposium audience. So if you're coming from the patient community, your your comment may, may be specifically about how you think this will serve the many patients and caregivers who attend the symposium. So it's very important to, um, to, to indicate that. Um, what is the relevance of, of this presentation? Is this an area that's of, of concern to us that will be helpful to us in our in our in in the work that you that you or your group does? Next slide. Just following along with the with the uh, with with the um, evaluation form, so you're looking for high quality abstract. Uh, I think I focus on the one clear and easy to understand. You can make comments there. Um, what I've done in the past is uh, highlighted words that I think are not understandable to lay people, um, so that they can they can change these. I mean, this this part, if you're a non-scientist, is uh, can be extremely helpful to uh, Cadith, and then of course the, the the subject and content of the abstract. Next slide. And. More, more comments, then you're either making a positive or a, re a negative recommendation. So your score has to be a minimum of, of, of 15 for a positive recommendation. And this is where uh, you can also suggest that uh, this, this abstract be accepted, but maybe not in the format that the people have specifically asked for. So maybe you think it would be better to have it in a shorter, maybe it's too long for 75 minutes, or maybe you think, wow, this is a topic that is hot, that people need, you know, um, are clamoring for more information about, you know, can you not, can you not suggest this to be a half-day workshop? You could certainly do that. There's, there's no rules to what you can put in the comments. I've been told by, by the CADIS uh, staff that the comments are extremely important, that this is really, you know, they, they, they read them all, they consider them all, and that they help along. So I'm going to move on. I'm going to show you what's going to happen once you've done your, your review. So next slide. Oh, I guess I'm not doing that right now. Okay, um, maybe the next slide after that. 
Yes. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip there. So so the scores, your recommendations, your comments are collated. That then goes to the program committee. And uh, and I, I'll just note that on the program committee, there's also our patient stakeholder on, on that committee. So they'll look at the um, they'll look at, at those recommendations, the scores, and they are the they are the committee that makes the uh, final recommendation. And I think that goes to the scientific director of the conference. So, but the comments are really key to the final go or no go decision. And now I'll go backwards. <laughs> Sorry, so, a previous slide. There we go. So back to my, my own experience doing it. The website is easy to navigate and um, the timelines are well defined. You have like two weeks to, to do the work. And uh, as always, the CATA staff is there to, to answer all of your questions. Or they're extremely helpful, very easy to get to. I'll skip ahead to two more slides. Okay, so what would be what would be some of the things that you would be looking for in in your review if you were coming from the patient community? You would you would be if it was a panel or a session, you would be checking does it provide a balanced perspective? Do they include a patient perspective? Um, is it the right group of stakeholders in your in your opinion who who should be discussing this? Uh, and that doesn't just include patient patient stakeholders. You you could be saying, well, you know what? There should be a pair at, uh, on this panel. Um, are the topics relevant to patients? And again, about the abstract, is it written in lay language? So you have to imagine that that abstract is going to, if it's selected, is going to appear on a website where people are going to make choices about which sessions to attend. And if you've been to a CATA symposium, you'll know that there are many, many sessions and it's not easy to select. So is that abstract written in a way that the, the patients who are going to be selecting that session really understand what's going to be discussed during that panel and can make an informed decision? So I think that's, that's really important. You want the people that go to the, who go to the symposium to have the best possible experience Part of that experience is selecting the right sessions to go to. So your so the abstract has a big impact on that. Next slide. So why why would you volunteer to be a reviewer? Well, it's an excellent opportunity to ensure that patients are engaged in the planning of symposium sessions. Um, you're, you can flag abstracts where a patient's perspective is not included or is not or 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 is not balanced. You can suggest ways to improve abstracts. Um, it gives you an inside look at current topics in, 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 the, in the entire world of HTA. So you're receiving these abstracts and you're, you're seeing what are the top of mind topics? What are the important ones? So it's interesting on, on, on that front. And you basically have a say in the choice of the session to provide a final program that truly reflects the patients and stakeholders. And you know what? You get to see your name in the program. So you enjoy that. There you go. I think that's my last slide, but let's let's see. Oh, yeah, and I wanted to uh, I wanted to give uh, Peter an opportunity as the as part of the team that receives the abstracts to uh, add anything to what I said about um, what specifically they're looking for or examples in the past where where the abstract reviewers have been specifically very helpful in in, in helping the scientific. Um, will the program committee make, make final recommendations? And I'll stop there. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, Peter, did you want to mention anything about Maureen, the impact of the patients being part of the review committee? Sure. Thanks, Maureen. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, I don't want to give you, uh, I, it's difficult for me to provide a specific example. I can tell you in general uh, what happens. So, we receive uh, a growing number of abstracts every year, hundreds of them, uh, and it's it's quite a process to uh, to go to go through them. But what happens uh, is we look at the the recommendations first. Quite often, you'll have uh, all three or more reviewers uh, say this should definitely be part of the program. So they're recommending acceptance. Those are fairly easy, and then you'll have other ones where all three of them say, we do not recommend this to be part of the program. That's also very easy. It's that gray area where two people have said, yes, 
this should be part of the program, and one person has said no, that the comments become extremely helpful. So having a, a, a sense from different perspectives of why this is or, or is not seen as a valuable addition to the, the symposium really helps us narrow things down and ensure that we're taking the best, uh, the, that we're accepting the, the best uh, abstracts that will speak to a large group of people. So hopefully that, that helps you with that. Thanks, dear. Thanks, Maureen, and thanks to Linda, too, to all our speakers, really, for these thoughtful presentations and these practical advice. I think uh, it really gives um, a sense of what's involved when you want to contribute and, and volunteer for, for the planning and the preparation of the program. Um, and thanks for sharing your experiences as well. And to all our participants, if you haven't thought of questions already, and I see a, a couple have come in, but you can feel free to share your questions um, by email or through the webinar chat box. And while uh, you gather your thoughts to do that, I will just put up um, the key dates that we should look out for. So look out for a call for abstracts. Um, that's today, so <laughs> you should be seeing that very soon. You'll have um, until the 26th to um, prepare your abstracts and submit them. And then, as Maureen pointed out, there will be a call for abstract reviewers. So if you're interested in contributing that way, you can look for a call for those, um, a call for reviewers to sit on the review committee um, September 24th. Um, we do have a travel award program, and um, that is also going to be announced the week of the 24th of September. And finally, the recognition awards and nominations, that will be the week of October 1st. So if any of those um, categories or any of those dates are important to you, I just wanted to put them up there to help you in your planning. Uh, uh, if, if I may, just to respond to a comment Linda made earlier, uh, you'll notice that the, uh, the timing of the notification for travel awards uh, and the abstracts are, uh, are very closely linked in early January. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, I guess um, we have uh, lots of time for discussion. So I will start by um, just sort of um, sharing some questions that we've had, and then um, we'll put it to the panel to see um, if there's any answers, or I might be able to answer some myself. Um, to start off with, it's, um, it's a bit about the question about what, what, is a, what is a patient or what does the patient mean. So do any patients within that category identify as caregivers? And, and does CADIS accept and review abstracts to review from patients only, or do we include caregivers in that category also? And I would say that we include caregivers in that category also, definitely. And um, we've been trying to use the term patient community because um, the patient relevant um, submissions that we get come from people who are patient advocates, who work in the area of patient engagement, who are people with chronic disease or any kind of uh, living with any kind of health issue and also their caregivers. In the past, we've been able to um, fund also through the Travel Award Program a companion for somebody who wanted to participate but, uh, but needed um, their caregiver to come with them. So we recognize that, that important role of caregivers and their, and their perspectives when it comes to symposiums. Thank you for that, bringing that up. We often, uh, we often don't mention caregivers as much. Okay, so our next question, um, I'll just read it out here. Some patient organizations do not feel our views are adequately represented at CADIS because we choose not to accept funds from the pharmaceutical industry and lack the resources to engage fully with drug policy issues. Question, does CADIS recognize this problem? And if so, does the agency have plans to address it? And so I just want to say thank you for that question. It's a, it's a big one. Um, what I'll say is that part of um, the reason for this webinar is to reiterate our um, need for diversity of perspective and to include everyone um, under that, that patient category to feel free to um, not only submit abstracts but also be um, involved in the choosing of what abstracts are accepted. And I'll just find out if Peter would like to say anything from the, from the organizational point of view. Sure, uh, uh, and, and thanks for the opportunity. It's, it's, a, it's a very big question, and certainly, uh, if I'm reading it correctly, uh, goes far beyond the symposium itself. Um, I can only speak from the perspective of the symposium today. Um, we are, as Tamara said, fully supportive of diversity uh, at the symposium. Um, 
that includes all types of patient groups and perspectives. Uh, and I would just point back to the, uh, the travel awards as one way uh, that facilitates uh, participation and engagement with a wide variety of groups, including, including policymakers. Finally, I would point out that we have, we have criteria that we follow when we're reviewing requests uh, for travel awards. One of the things we look at is uh, whether someone has uh, submitted an abstract, uh, it, it to us demonstrates that there's a clear uh, interest and a level of engagement. So submitting an abstract, whether or not it is accepted, uh, just adds to the likelihood that you will receive a travel award to attend the symposium. I hope that helps address your question at least a little bit. Great. Thanks, Peter, for that. I think uh, I hope that helps. Um, our next question um, is, can I volunteer to be a reviewer and also be part of the abstract uh, review committee as well? And I think, or sorry, also submit an abstract as well. And I would say that yes, um, that that's true. You can do both. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's happened on more than one occasion. And you won't be assigned your own review, your abstract to be reviewed. <laughs> I have to admit that, uh, that on one occasion, uh, someone was assigned their own uh, abstract to review. Uh, they gave it high marks and also reported themselves so that we didn't uh, we didn't include their evaluation. Uh, Maureen or, or Linda, do, do you have anything to add to that, or or have you had that experience of both a reviewer and someone who um, submitted an abstract? Yes, this is Linda. Actually, we have, as I said, uh, all our board members are listed as co-authors when we submit an abstract. So Lori Pruel uh, was actually on the abstract review committee, reviewed the abstracts last year, and I know for a fact she didn't review my abstract. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, our next question goes back to the, the um, symposium as a whole. Will CADIS be adopting a robust patient code of conduct for Edmonton? Um, the, the answer, and I'll let Peter speak about this more, I'll just to give you some clarification. We will have a code of conduct for our next symposium. It won't be for patients. It will be for all the participants. Um, did you want to add anything to that, Peter? Or um, Sure. It's, it's, uh, we're actually uh, putting together a code of conduct for uh, not just the symposium, but for all CADIS events. As Tamara says, it's not directed at the patients, it's directed at all attendees. Uh, and our, our, it's in the process of being drafted now, so it will be ready to go by the time we open registration for uh, the 2019 symposium. That happens uh, in uh, early January. We'll be asking people to uh, indicate their agreement uh, to abide by the Code of Conduct in order to register to attend the symposium. Thank you. I'll just give it a few more minutes in case anyone wants to uh, ask any follow-up questions or um, anything else to add. Maybe on that same theme about um, attending the, the symposium from the patient perspective, Maureen or Linda, did you want to say what your experience has been like as an attendee? Sure, I can uh, I can speak to that. It, uh, it, I've attended a number of CADA symposiums. Uh, I found them to be very accessible for patients. I find that uh, the program, the planning committee, has been very open to suggestions on uh, how they can make it easier for patients to to attend the symposium. That uh, they're long days and uh, often exhausting at the end of the day, as uh, Maureen has alluded to in another conversation. Uh, that often with patients, we we can't make the evening events and that's what happened to me in Halifax. I couldn't make the evening events because the days with the breakfast session starting at often 7.30 in the morning, you're up early and by the end of the day, you really do need to go back to your room and rest. And uh, I found that, you know, that's, that's been very, they've been very good for patients in the poster sessions uh, about having chairs at po at the posters. I, I think this year they had some at for the 
for the patients who were presenting. So uh, just little things like that that can make it easy for a patient to uh, get through a long day. Thank yeah, you. I can add to that too. I've attended a number of candidate symposiums and uh, I agree with Linda, they are accessible. Like Linda, I've never attended the evening events either. <laughs> That's the, just the reality of living with a chronic health condition. When you, when you sign up for these events, you have to pace yourself. And I think that uh, uh, patients and caregivers know, know very well that um, they're not going to be partying in the evening uh, when they've attended sessions all day. Um, I found, I, I've all, I always find it a very um, interesting symposium, uh, lots of choices, um, always something that's relevant to, um, to, to the patient experience. There's a, there's a wide variety of sessions from beginner sessions uh, where people maybe are coming for the first time or just coming, just, just beginning to have interest in health technology assessment. There are some beginner sessions. But then there's also some very in-depth sessions for uh, people who have been doing it for a number of years and um, need to keep up and, and, and learn more so that they can advocate meaningfully and they can participate meaningfully. So I find that there really is a very good balance of sessions. And, you know, let's face it, uh, health technology assessment is not the most exciting topic around. So you have to work pretty hard to make it interesting. And I think that they've done a good job of that. And I I always really appreciate the fact that the travel award is um, given out ahead of time. So I'm not out of pocket and I have a really good idea on what's going to be covered and what's not going to be covered and what I can and can't do with the allowance that I've been given. There's no guessing and there's no surprises when I submit something at the end and find out that, oh, that wasn't included and I thought it had been. So I, I find that, that the fact that they're with patients included and they follow um, those those guidelines are, are really um, very helpful. And I'll stop there. Thank you. I, I, sure, Peter. I, I just wanted to say uh, to, to say thanks uh, to both of you for for mentioning that uh, CATA staff is very open to uh, to suggestions and ideas. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to make a, a, an open offer to people that that if they have suggestions about the symposium or possibly about the code of conduct, they should feel free to send their suggestions along to the email address that, that we have, and we'll certainly take a look at at all of those. We try and make it. Uh, uh, a, a friendly uh, event that fully engages patients and, in fact, all of the stakeholder groups that attend the symposium. So, really open to your suggestions. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. And I would also um, also share that I'm also open to hearing from anybody who has suggestions um, or comments about any part of um, of patient engagement with CATIS. So. Um, I think the code of conduct is important and we're seeing it more and more at health conferences and, and indeed it's a, almost universal in every conference more and more these days. People are being uh, uh, aware and trying to make an effort to um, give people a peace of mind that when they come to the event that they're going to be able to share their perspectives in a, in a safe way. So um, I see now that we have two or three um, comments, suggestions, and uh, questions about the code of conduct. Um, for example, um, will other stakeholders have to sign it? It's, it's one overall code of conduct for every for all the CADIS events. So it's, uh, it's basically all the stakeholders who wish to participate. Yes, they will. Um, I have some other suggestions here about acknowledging funding sources and asking what the consequences would be. Um, the code of conduct is under development right now, so um, this is actually perfect timing. If you have had experience in other events, or other codes of conduct, that would be great to, to hear from you. Um, there was a question, um, I don't want to lose sight of it, Peter, and that was just somebody asking to just go over the differences between the poster versus the panel versus the workshop. Like, you had a slide there that sort of explained what format would be the best for which type of, um, of presentation. I, I wonder um, if you just want to briefly mention it. And I'll also tell all the participants that the recording of this will be available afterwards. So um, people can certainly um, do that. Shall I go back to the slide? Yeah, I can't find, I can't find my, own, my own notes, actually. Sure, that's fine. But, uh, well, you're right at the beginning. I did, I tucked them away. So here we go. Uh, a, a poster presentation is 
like if you if you apply to do a, to do a poster, uh, we'll send you the exact dimensions and so on of the poster, and it's it's displayed uh, uh, with all the other posters. We typically have about uh, about 80 posters that are presented at the symposium. The posters are up for the duration. Um, if you haven't been to the Cata Symposium before, uh, on the Sunday we have uh, workshops and cor short courses throughout the day. So either half day workshops or, or full day workshops. Uh, and that's followed by uh, a, a brief period where we have meet and greets for a patient, for the patient community and a separate one for students who are attending. So our CEO and some of the, uh, of the, uh, of the vice presidents members of the executive team and uh, some key staff who work with those groups uh, also attend and frequently say a few words. Uh, but it's just that piece is just a very good way for uh, all the patients who are there to get to know each other uh, so they don't feel uh, as isolated as they sometimes might when you walk into a big uh, conference and you don't know anyone. That is followed by uh, a welcome reception for all attendees uh, where the posters uh, are the star of the show. So uh, it's an opportunity for people to have some appetizers, uh, a glass of wine, uh, and walk around and see all of the posters. The poster authors, primary authors, uh, are, are on site, so it's an opportunity to engage with people who are interested in your poster topic. But the posters remain up. They don't rotate them or change them. They remain up throughout the duration of the symposium. Uh, and typically, uh, authors will go and stand by their poster uh, during uh, breaks because there's lots of people who travel through and want to want to discuss the poster content. So a, a poster is a really good way to start. It's it's uh, uh, if if you if you haven't submitted a, a, an abstract before, um, what I said earlier was that it's it's a good way to present targeted research. So it's not necessarily of interest to uh, to everyone or even a broad uh, a broad uh, uh, number of, of attendees, but it will be of interest to a specific group. The posters are very good for that, and they're also very good for work that hasn't been completed. So something that's in progress, just so you can share your thinking about it, and usually get thoughts from from the people who uh, who attend and look at your poster. Oral presentations are usually 15 to 20 minutes long. The length depends on how many uh, presentations we put into the same grouping. We we do our best to group. The, uh, the oral presentations thematically, so that we'll have a number of patient, a number of, of presentations that are all about health, health economics, or hospital-based uh, HTA, or uh, patient engagement, uh, similar topics like that. So uh, panel discussions are, in a, in a sense, from the outside, they look very similar to uh, to an oral presentation, except that the author, uh, the organizer of the panel, has thought through those connections and has invited the appropriate experts to be part of the panel. So the, the panel will focus on one topic, bringing in a number of different perspectives. We don't like to have more than four people on a panel, uh, plus a moderator. Uh, our experience has shown us that uh, when you add more voices, well, you may be more representative, uh, it reduces the amount of time for, for everyone to speak, and you don't have as a fulsome of a discussion. The breakfast sessions, uh, because they're first thing in the morning, uh, they tend to attract a slightly smaller audience. 20 to 30 people, I think, is, is about right for what you get at a breakfast session. Uh, but it's an opportunity to talk to people who are interested in uh, a specific topic uh, and are willing to get up at that time. And, and our experience has been, since we introduced the breakfast sessions, they all receive about that number of attendees, 20 to 30. And the workshops, as I mentioned, uh, we like them to be very interactive uh, and engaging. Um, they're often but not always focused on, on uh, technical or methodological topics. So th in, in many respects, the workshops are, are in large part an opportunity for the, the HCA producers and researchers to really engage uh, in their own professional development activities. But we also offer a number of workshops that are for other groups. So I mentioned uh, elsewhere in the presentation that we tend to offer an introduction to health technology assessment uh, workshop, uh, and we often uh, offer critical appraisal workshops that you know uh, uh, 
sometimes give you a, a practical example of here's the evidence that you received, what do you do with it? So that gives you a pretty good sense of the range of, uh, of presentation options. Great. Thanks, Peter, for that review. Um, I think it will help when people are choosing um, what to submit and what category their work falls under in the best way. So um, just seeing what other questions are coming in. Um, there are some coming in about the code of conduct question, and I think um, just to reiterate that we're, since it's under development, please do send your specific requests about that to, to us. Um, someone has asked, why is the code of conduct necessary? Um, I think um, I've touched on that a little bit, but also I wanted to just recall Peter's slide about how many different perspectives are at the Catus Symposium. So we're having people from many, many different areas and different um, um, angles and different viewpoints coming together. And the code of conduct is just one way of everyone sort of like um, knowing how they can expect to be treated um, while they're at the symposium. And it's as simple as that really. And as I mentioned, it's not just the CADIS, um events that are considering this, but it's um, most other um, most other events that you will find if you if you have a look to other things that you attend, you you'll likely find a code of conduct. And if you see one that you think is fair and well written, please do send it to us because, as I say, we're developing that now. So hopefully that clears that up. But if it doesn't, of course, um, continue to uh, to get in touch with us. I'm going to put it back on the slide that has our email address so that people can be in touch. Sorry to rush through all these. There's many ways to stay connected, actually. There's our general um, ways. And then you can also do symposium at caddis.ca with any additional questions. And that will go to our events team. And um, they, can, they can, anything specific about the symposium, or they'll be able to answer. I think we might um, we might be at the end of our event today, and I wanted to just go back and thank all of our speakers again, Maureen, Linda, Peter. Thank you very much for um, for sharing your experiences, and um, I hope that people found it useful. And uh, I hope we hear from you soon with your submissions or your offer to help with the review committee. Thank you. Thank you.